Good afternoon. We're taking a look at the Atlantic right now. Saharan dust keeping things quiet. I'm meteorologist Rebecca Berry from WFLA tracking the tropics center here. You can see that we are watching not a lot of much in the tropics right now. It is very quiet. There are a couple of reasons behind that. And so I'm going to bring in our chief meteorologist and climate specialist, Jeff Berardelli. We have those four little words. Everyone in a coastal zone wants to hear the tropics are quiet. And we have a couple of reasons behind that. We also have a look at some products that we'll be utilizing this year when the tropics do start to act up. Jeff? All right, yeah, I mean, just let's pause for a second. Did you hear that pin drop? Because so, yeah. that's how quiet it is. Yeah. I, it, honestly, I can't remember a time in my career where for such a long stretch during the month of July, it's incredibly quiet. Now, of course, there are times in July, in fact, a lot of times in July where we do not see anything. No tropical depressions, no tropical storms, no hurricanes. In fact, oftentimes uh, for the staff here at, at this station and every station I've worked at, I'd rather people take off during the month of July, meteorologists, than during June because June's usually more active. So the point is, it's not abnormal for it to be quiet, meaning not to have tropical systems that are named, but to literally have nothing that even has potential, that is really rare. So that's just how quiet it is right now. Across the Gulf of Mexico, there is nothing there that looks suspect. There is nothing that is suspicious across the Caribbean, and there is nothing that is suspicious anywhere across the Atlantic Basin right now. So development not expected over the next five days. And if you look at some of our computer models, you can extend that to 10 days. And then if you believe the computer models beyond 10 days, and sometimes it's hard to believe computer models beyond 10 days, but if you believe them out to two, three plus weeks, there's still very few hints that anything is gonna become active in the tropical Atlantic anytime soon. Now, typically things really start to take a, a, a very fast upswing in the middle of August. So we still have about three weeks before we hit that mark. So don't be surprised if all of a sudden it just turns on like that. But for right now, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing any evidence of that. So you can see we have these seedlings, we call them, or these tropical waves moving off Africa. There's one there. But notice how it just kind of disintegrates when it moves over the eastern Atlantic Ocean. We have another one behind it. Now, we do have an impulse of energy right now as we speak, kind of traversing Africa. And so we expect that some robust waves are going to come off. But one of the biggest problems is just because you have a wave doesn't mean that there's a favorable environment for it to develop. Water temperatures are plenty warm. In fact, in many parts of the Atlantic, water temperatures are above normal. But what we do have is a whole lot of Saharan dust. And a big part of it is right on top of those tropical waves that are moving off Africa right now. So this is a dry air and stable air in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, not allowing these systems to really get better formed. Uh, tropical systems need a very nurturing environment, and that is just not present across the Atlantic Basin and won't be present at least for the next week. This is one of our computer models, and I'm going to run it out over the next 10 days or so. And what you notice is there are showers and thunderstorms across the intertropical convergence zone and across uh, the Caribbean, but you don't really see any hints of robust development across the basin, at least for the next five to 10 days. But where it is active right now is the Eastern Pacific, and it's been pretty active. Look, we're up to Frank already in the Pacific, and we have another system that could be in the process of forming right there. So we'll show you where these are going to be tracking, and they're not going to be threatening land, so they're not moving towards Central America. They're just going to move out over the open waters of the Pacific Ocean. But this may be the key, at least one key, to why the Atlantic is so quiet right now. Typically, you pick. It's either active in the Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, or it's active in the Atlantic. But it's not common that they're both very active at the same time. It's been pretty active in the Eastern Pacific. So that's one of the reasons why it's not very active right now in the Atlantic. Now, as we look ahead to August, systems in June, they tend to form close to home, right around uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, in July, we see a lot of activity off of the east coast of the U.S. That's where they form. This time of year, we start to shift our attention into the deep tropical Atlantic and the main development region to the east of the Lesser Antilles. That's where most of the systems form. So as we turn the page in October, this is the area we're going to be watching most closely. So where are we uh, if you compare us to 2020 or 2021? Well, you know, 2020 by now we had nine tropical systems, two of those hurricanes. In 2021, we had five tropical systems, and this year we've only had three, and a couple of these barely even formed, if you remember. So it really has been a very quiet 
uh, system. So here's the uptick that we told you about. We, we tend to see activity begin to pick up the beginning of August, really start to shoot almost straight upward in the middle of August. And our most active period is from, you know, the second or third week in August straight through the end of September. And we here especially on the west coast of Florida tend to see another peak here in October because our, a lot of our systems come from the Gulf, from the west, and, and that's that secondary peak that you see right there. So uh, the bottom line is we are very quiet right now. I hope it stays that way, but of course, we've seen many seasons that are really quiet and then all of a sudden they pick up like that. So I'm going to send it back to you guys, uh, Rebecca, and I'll come join you uh, next to you in a couple minutes or really a couple seconds because I'm only, what, 15 feet away from you. I can see you yeah. behind me. You're about <laughs> five steps. You have eyes behind your head? <laughs> no, I've got a monitor. Oh, okay. <laughs> We do have four, a couple of new products, though, that the National Hurricane Center is combining and really enhancing to help us moving forward. And this really stemmed from a couple of different storms that we saw, mainly Irma, where inland flooding and river flooding became such an issue. Now, a lot of these products existed before this, but they were hard to find. They were run by different organizations like the National Water Center. Um, hydrology products are difficult to interpret in some cases. So what the National Hurricane Center and a lot of these organizations are trying to do is give us a better idea and a better communication of risk for inland flooding, for river flooding, and earlier advance notice of that. So what we're looking at right now is the National Water Center's visualization, visualization services. And a lot of times when we talk about river flooding, you'll see us pull out this, this graph and it, it's got colors on it and it has a line going up showing how we expect the river to be flooding over the next seven to ten days and so they're enhancing that product and they're going to put out a couple of different looks for that we're what we're looking at right now is an 18 hour rapid onset flooding probability forecast for the nation and so this is one of the things that we'll be we'll have access to it'll look better than it has in the past and they've also changed some of the terminology and moving from terminology like bankful which a lot of people might not know what that means to high water and so a high water mark or when when the water is going to be above the banks of the river and so that's just one of the simplest simpler things that they're doing yeah you know i think it's interesting and it makes sense to me and i can either look at you here because you know literally we can almost it's like Burp. yeah three feet here <laughs> uh but um you know i think that the high winds always get the attention in hurricanes obviously and the storm surge is second right we don't talk about the inland flood threat as much so i think the national hurricane center is obviously making a concerted effort to prioritize that uh, because oftentimes the damage and uh, unfortunately the deaths occur from from flooding you you know you're most scared of the wind but it's oftentimes flooding either it's inland flooding like you're like we're speaking of freshwater flooding or it's storm surge flooding that's the most dangerous so i can understand why they're prioritizing this now I think the Carolinas is really going to benefit from this because oftentimes we'll get the storms that hit the Outer Banks, but once the storm disintegrates and moves inland in the Carolinas, mm -hmm. we see terrible flooding from that. And so I think this is one of those areas. And other areas that might really benefit from this are areas that don't normally see tropical storms or mm -hmm. tropical systems For or sure. deal with those at all. And mm -hmm. you get that flooding up the east coast of the U.S. I mean, remember Irma last year? I, that was unbelievable. It was believable, though, because... The day before that, our computer models were, in fact, predicting about a one in 500 year event. And I think that the communication was what was lacking there. Uh, don't get me wrong, you know, it was mentioned here or there on Twitter, but you'd really have to be someone like me or Rebecca to have found it, to know just how substantial that flooding around the New York City and Philadelphia area was going to be. The information was there but it wasn't communicated very well to the public and it caught people off guard so i think that's one of the reasons why you see an emphasis on these on these products what we ended up with was a one in a 500 year or one in a thousand year flood uh from irma in the new york city area and surrounding areas as well extremely populated area um so this will help address that and so what you're looking at right now is a flood hazard outlook product that's going to be issued for the next seven days and so as trump this is a product that's existed but not necessarily been included in the tropical realm and now it will be and so we'll have an we'll have an outlook we'll have um, areas drawn on the map showing where we're, they expect to see a risk of inland flash mm -hmm. flooding and they're adding to that an impact level and because flooding is different in different areas if it's a flood plain and there's not a lot of uh, development there it would be a very low impact despite the fact that it is flooded mm -hmm. but if it's a populous area you're going to see that impact level higher and especially when we, certain rivers and certain 
certain areas have thresholds, and if those thresholds are crossed, uh, the water goes up to a certain point, then there's much more inundation and much more damage and a higher impact. So this is a combination of a couple of products, and it's being included in the tropics now as well. So that's pretty neat that we're going to see that sort of a product for us and a, a better communication of that flood risk. In addition, they're going to start hydraulic short-term discussions for specific areas when they see an area that they expect for the flooding to occur, we're going to get a very specific detailed map and it's going to show us where they expect flooding, how much ex flooding they expect, and it's going to use forecasted rainfall, already rain, already seen rainfall totals, as well as the specific hydrology of that area. And that's something we really lacked with Irma across the state of Florida with the inland flooding, because we were not looking at how much mm. rain went into the basin of the St. John's River and which direction it was going to end up flowing. And so that, that taught us a lesson as meteorologists and the meteorological communities responding with products mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, they do this. They try to improve every single year. Uh, especially the communication part. I think that's where scientists often lack, right? So making sure that we're kind of bridging the gap and also not concentrating on the center of the storm all the time, because oftentimes it's days later and outside of the center of the storm that we see the worst impacts. And every storm has its own personality, doesn't it? Uh, you know, you, you, you look at two storms, they look exactly alike on the satellite, but one of them ends up being a huge wind damage storm, and the next one ends up being a big storm surge storm, and the next one ends up just being a big inland flooding threat. So that happened in New York City, uh, and it was interesting because it happened right before Sandy. I think that was Irene, Hurricane Irene, which weakened substantially. And all the, all the news crews, if you remember, were, of course, they were in New York City. They were in Long Island. They were in New Jersey along the coast. And everybody was like, well, it's barely blowing. There's barely any wind. And then like a day later, they realized that whole towns in upstate New York and Pennsylvania were swept away because— they were because everyone was concentrating on the wrong part of the threat. So this is something that we need to remind ourselves of that um, hurricanes are a lot more than that, that center core, that eye wall and that eye. Um, you know, Rebecca, I want to talk a little bit more about what might be going on this season, why it's so quiet right now uh, and and whether or not we expect to see more more. So I have a little hypothesis here, Rebecca. Okay. Okay. So the Pacific Ocean, we're in a very strong La Nina right now. Very strong. So temperatures are well below normal in the tropical Pacific Ocean. What's most important, and, and you, if you've watched this show, you know I talk about this sometimes, most important is relativity. So not, not, not Einsteinian relativity, but relative warm temperatures, warm water temperatures. So if it's really cool in the Pacific, then even if it's not really warm in the Atlantic, as long as it's warmer, then that's where the thunderstorms will form. They'll tend to form tropical systems. What's happening with this La Nina in the Pacific is it's kind of skewed towards the Central Pacific, not the Eastern Pacific right now. So it's cool, very cool. In fact, one of the coolest La Ninas we've had, but not in the very Eastern Pacific, not closest to the Atlantic. That's where water temperatures are about normal. And at times, every once in a while, we actually see temperatures pop above normal in the far Eastern Pacific. So it may just simply be that because the La Nina is skewed a little bit west into the Central Pacific, that the relative warm water that it feels is actually in the Eastern Pacific and not necessarily in the Atlantic. So it's just one little, one little part of it. There's also the other part. You, you know, if you're watching, if you watch often, you, you'll hear me talk about the MJO, uh, these these subseasonal climate cycles. Essentially, what we're talking about here is waves of energy that 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 permeate the atmosphere over the course of sometimes a week or two and sometimes over the course of a month or more so there are those signals that you could never see with your eyes but we can see in the data and the signals are not progressing very quickly or at all across the basins this year they're kind of almost stuck and they're also not very robust signatures oftentimes if you earlier this uh, this season first couple of tracking the tropics i was able to show you the MJO, able to show you those, essentially those waves. I haven't been able to show you them because they are, they're not pointing in any one direction. They're not giving us much, much, much to work with. Uh, typically we see more robust signals, but we just don't have them. It's not really clear where those, 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 that energy is moving. And that energy is extraordinarily important in ignition to get these systems to actually to get a wave of low pressure that's coming off Africa beyond Saharan dust, to get it to spin up, you need to have kind of a favorable pulse of energy, if you will, that's, that's riding across a certain basin. And we just simply haven't seen that. So even if we didn't have this Saharan dust, we likely wouldn't be seeing formation in the Eastern Atlantic right now because we don't have 
the ignition. It's kind of like the spark to start the fire, if you will. We just, we just don't have that. And I have to be honest with you, I don't see robust signs for the next couple of weeks, which is probably why the European models forecast over the next four weeks doesn't show any development across the Atlantic. And it just seems really quiet. Doesn't mean it's going to be right. Models have been wrong before, and they've been wrong many times this summer. But it, it, it's one tool in our in our toolkit that that shows that it could remain quiet, not just for the next five or ten days, but for the next couple to few weeks. Okay, I've said a lot. I like it. <laughs> I was thinking of when you were talking about how we're not seeing those strong signatures. When you look at the forecast, this feels like an early June pattern right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it let that big plume of Saharan dust looks yep. like, like a classic May and June pattern, and it just feels yeah. like we haven't progressed past those first few weeks of June. <sighs> in terms of our overall weather pattern in the Atlantic right now. So I'm hoping that those waters stay a little warmer in the extreme Eastern Pacific, because if that's what's keeping us quiet, I like listen, it. Listen, I don't think anyone's complaining. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know. listen, when it turns on here, we are here like 18 hours a day, you know, as, as you can imagine. And, and, and it only takes one storm. So it could be completely quiet. You get one storm. Andrew was a good example of that. It was a, it was a year where there were very few storms. Andrew was obviously the first, the A storm, and it was, a Cat 5, which was one of the most destructive storms in U.S. history. So just because it's quiet doesn't mean it's, it's not going to ramp up quickly. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to get a very impactful storm. You know, it doesn't matter how many storms there are in a season. What matters is if they hit populated areas. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it only takes one storm for it to be a terrible season for you yeah. if it ends up impacting Four. you. I do sure. know that the northern Gulf is more excited about the tropics being quiet this time of the year than anyone. You know, they got hammered for the past couple of years, several years over there. and over and over yeah. again. And th once the Bermuda high starts to shift, it gets a lot quieter in the Gulf for the middle of the season there. It's more uh, more of an impact along the East Coast by the late yep. season. So I'm, I'm yep. sure that the northern Gulf's very excited about how quiet it's been during this prime time for them. That's right. And then for us, you know, I worry most about October because that's the time of year when storms can form in the Caribbean. And when they go north, because the prevailing wind flow has changed, so during the summertime, the prevailing wind flow blows everything from east to west. So storms will often traverse the Caribbean, head straight into the Gulf of Mexico and to Texas or Mexico. Uh, or they'll make a little turn at the end and head towards Louisiana. Um, or they or they're further north and they slam into the east coast of Florida or go up towards South Carolina. But it's very rare in August, especially, that a storm will move north and then be able to take a quick turn to the right and move into the western part of Florida. But as we head towards October, the jet stream starts to strengthen and drops down from Canada. And now all of a sudden we have westerly steering flow across the Gulf. So what I'm most concerned about is what happens here for us. Uh, in October, because that's when we're most likely to take a direct hit. Well, fingers crossed. Yes, oh, exactly. Oh, goodness. <laughs> so no rain dances. Rub your lucky rabbit's foot. Keep those fingers crossed. We are loving how quiet the tropics is mm -hmm. right now and for the forecastable future. Uh, we will be back here next week at 2 o'clock for the next Track in the Tropics, hopefully talking about another quiet week in the tropics. And we'll have some handy tools to show you as well. But if anything does fire up, of course, as soon as we see anything out there, we hop on Tracking the Tropics and update you immediately. But as for now, I'm going to bid farewell. Thank you. And I will do the same. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Sebastian, for, for running this. And uh, everybody's fingers crossed. Let's just keep it quiet the rest of the season, okay? Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching Tracking the Tropics.